Warning, this week's episode is not safe for work. So quit. Fuck that job anyway. They don't love you like we do. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by My Sheets Rock, Stamps.com, and by the new adhesive designed to keep the Christian worldview firmly in place, even in the light of overwhelming arguments to the contrary. Crucifixident. Crucifixident. Because the arguments on the Christian side bite. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Oh, hello. I'm Tyler. And I'm Ty. And we're from the TNT Podcast. The show where we'll talk about anything, and I mean anything. Except that thing you're thinking of. Unless that thing is the fact that we did, in fact, evolve Evolve from from filthy filthy monkey monkey men. men. And women. It's August 19th. And it's International Talk Like Jar Jar Binks Day. (laughs) Me's way more problematic than you remember. Yeah, right, right. (laughs) I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And for Mike, the situation Sorrentino's New Jersey, (laughs) Cincinnati Red State, and Redtown Blue State, this is the scathing atheist on this week's episode Islam finds a worse use for an eight year old than its prophet did. Ouch. We learn again that it's not like the Holocaust. Whatever you're about to say, no, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> and Tom and Cecil from Cognitive Dissonance will be here to make the paying customers cry. But first, the diatribe. If you set aside the possibility that religions are correct and That's kind of a prerequisite to listening to this show. One of the few potential justifications left for them is the argument that even without being true, they can encourage people to do the right thing. Sure, it may be a lie, but it's a lie that tells people to love their neighbor and treat others the way that they would like to be treated. Now, to be clear, even if it were true, that would be a terrible justification. But as bad as that justification is, turns out religions can't actually do that shit anyway. And we're being reminded of that daily as we watch religious leaders the world over desperately try to rein in their own stupid long enough to get people vaccinated. When Mormon leadership issued a statement last Thursday reminding their members the importance of getting the jab, the response was an uproar against the leadership. Some like 50 percent of practicing Mormons are refusing to get vaccinated. So it's a moral fucking imperative to change their minds. And yet the quorum of 12 apostles was completely useless in swaying their opinions. Now, keep in mind, by Mormon mythology, these people are prophets, seers, revelators and special witnesses of Jesus Christ himself. And yet they were unable to move the needle on vaccines. And move the needle. That's pretty, that's pretty good. And, and, and that's hardly unique. Hell, it's not even the best example, right? None other than the goddamn Pope has been screaming himself hoarse for months about the importance of getting vaccinated. And yet I've got stories here out of North Carolina and Colorado about Catholic churches handing out a free religious exemption to vaccination with every magical cracker. The Pope is supposed to be the goddamn direct successor of St. Peter and small detail here in fucking fallible. The religion is built around the idea that this guy is physically incapable of being incorrect. And yet even Catholic priests are rejecting his authority for the sake of promoting their anti-vax message. Now, to be fair, there's some evidence that religious leaders are able to make a difference here, especially with communities of color. A recent survey by PRRI showed at least a nominal decrease in so-called vaccine hesitancy that they could attribute to religious messaging among Hispanic Catholics and black Protestants. But Even that meager victory pales in comparison to the effectiveness of doctors on the same group of people. The survey after survey shows that for pretty much every category of people, regardless of their religiosity, the authority most likely to change their minds on vaccines is a doctor. Now, you know, medicine is their area of expertise, so you might think that's irrelevant to the larger discussion. Of course, people are more likely to trust the medicine expert on matters of medicine. They're also probably more likely to trust the religion expert on matters of religion. And and that may be true, but it's worth noting that doctors never had to lie to get there. Doctors didn't have to say that the 
their patients were immortal or pretend their dead pets were waiting for them in the bonus stages or offer up some contrived meaning for their existence to earn their trust. Doctors managed to gain it just by telling them the truth, even when the truth was fucking brutal. I mean, if you think about it, it should seem obvious that making your living lying to people is a terrible way to instill trust. You know, all religion ever told anybody is what they wanted to hear. How the hell is that going to prime them for hard truths? It's like, sorry to show my Gen Xness here, but you remember that Simpsons episode where Bart's trying to convince the dog trainer that Santa's little helper is trained by shouting out retroactive commands like go over there and sniff that dog's butt? You know, in the cartoon, Bart wasn't able to convince the trainer, but in the analogy, religious leaders were able to convince themselves the dog was trained. Think about that. So, like, religion says when you die, you you level up and you go to paradise, and everybody's like, "You bet your ass, we do." Hell yeah! And then he said, and, "And all the people you don't like that fucked you over and made you feel silly for believing that, they all go to eternal torture land." And everybody was like, "Hell yeah, I like this guy." And then he said, and the guy who fashioned the universe did it because he knew you were going to need a place to put your stuff eventually. And he loves you and he looks after you and he has a special plan that you play an important role in. And the crowd said, mommy, mommy, can we keep him? And the religious idiot sat there thinking, wow, I can convince these guys of anything. You know, meanwhile, the whole time science just told the damn truth. And keep in mind that as tough a truth as there is no afterlife and you're just a mutated monkey are. They're all the harder when they have to compete with religion's untethered bullshit. But since science kept making iPhones and spaceships and stuff, even the religious people decided to keep them around, though they continued to ignore all the dismal shit they had to say about, you know, mortality and random chance. And what we inadvertently created or advertently created, I don't know, was a system where those inclined to only hear the answers they wanted could switch back and forth between science and religion as they needed. More and more, in fact, that came to define religion's role in society. Some of the questions we ask have really scary answers that people would rather not dwell on. So religion's role increasingly became coming up with easy, satisfying, and ideally untestable answers to sub in. When you didn't like the answers that science gave you, you turned to religion. Now, the idea was that the questions we'd be subbing in religious answers for were mostly going to center around death and what comes afterwards. But apparently the American right is so full of snowflakes that answers like, yeah, man, you got to get the fucking shot were enough to trigger the backup plan. And that's where we are now. When the religious leader says, change your mind on vaccines, the people change their mind on religious leaders. And why the fuck wouldn't they? When the guy whose job is to tell you what you want to hear doesn't tell you what you want to hear, why the hell wouldn't you fire him? They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Pfizer and Moderna to my Johnson & Johnson, Heath Enright, and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to inoculate? No, I'd like to thank you for not making me the Johnson & Johnson, even though it would be a far more accurate comparison. Really appreciate yeah, it sounded that. Weird. Just metaphor. I feel the like end. the ivermectin of the group, actually. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we need to give all the horse parasites listening a minute to deal with that revelation. So we're going to pause for a quick word from our first sponsor this week. My sheets rock. And that's when we take the ridge. Well, you mean the pillows? Yes, I mean the pillow. We There's take a ridge. The hey, the guys. What's with the uh, military get up? Oh, hey, Noah. Heath is just helping me with the war for the air conditioner. The war for the air conditioner. Yeah, you see. Anna is a cold sleeper and I'm a hot sleeper. So we're just constantly battling over where to set the air conditioner in our room. But thanks to Heath here, this is going to get settled once and for all. Well, Eli, if you're a hot sleeper, why don't you just try the regulator sheets from My Sheets Rock? What are the regulator sheets from My Sheets Rock? They're designed specifically to keep hot sleepers cool and cold sleepers comfortable. They regulate temperature, wick moisture, stay breathable, and are so soft you'll sleep comfortably every night. That's because these sheets are made from best-in-class bamboo rayon, the holy grail of sheeting. This miracle material transfers body heat two times more effectively than regular sheets and reduces humidity by 50% so you can experience your best night's sleep yet. Yeah, they're pretty great. My Sheets Rock actually sent us a set to try when they became a sponsor, and they are my favorite sheets now. Wow, that does sound good. But Noah, what if I don't believe you? Don't believe me? Their five-star customer reviews speak for themselves. Plus, they offer a 90-day risk-free trial and free shipping and returns. Check out My Sheets Rock at MySheetsRock.com slash scathing and enter our code scathing for 10% off and free shipping. All right, Noah, thanks. I'm in. Oh, good. Because besides, don't you think the whole military siege thing would be a bit much for your wife? 
Oh, not at all. She has a trebuchet. Oh, okay. And now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, ever since the book came out, we've been way too focused, as Heath might have mentioned, on the various ways that religion is ruining our global pandemic. So I figured we could start this week's headline with a bit of an olive branch by highlighting some of the stuff that religious leaders are doing to ameliorate the crisis. Like, for example, dying of COVID midway through their COVID is <laughs> fake tirades. I have, I have multiple stories here. So <laughs> that brings us first to the story of Christian radio host Jimmy DeYoung Sr., who, in addition to putting senior in his name like it was a fucking honorific, died of COVID last Sunday after spending months discouraging his listeners from getting the vaccine. Oh, man, you got to watch out for that new irony variant. That would catch you. <laughs> the title's a little misleading, but right, that yes. is how they got you. <laughs> so, yeah, DeYoung has spent the better part of a year railing about the connection between the COVID vaccine and the mark of the beast, attributing the genesis of his concerns to such reliable and credible authorities as some people, an email in my inbox, and social media. Oh, all of them. Yeah, all three agree that the vaccine rollout lines up pretty well with apocalyptic prophecy. For example, and this is a real example that he uses in one of his tirades, if you assume that he's right and it's all a secret ploy by the devil using false signs and wonders, the part in Thessalonians about the Antichrist using false signs and wonders lines up exactly. Oh, those are the same words. Exactly yeah. right. And based on no more logic than that, he concluded that the true Christian should avoid the vaccine at all costs. And Beers hoping it was one of the people that believed him that originally coughed the fucking virus down his stupid goddamn maw. <laughs> okay, I like how he was picturing Satan, the prince of darkness, presenting a vaccine like he's a fucking carnival barker. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Check out the Wonder Tonic vaccine. Only a nickel. Only a really? nickel. Yeah. See, <laughs> I like I like that because he doesn't know how the vaccine works. It's literally magic. Yep. Right. right. There are the two categories, things he understands and literal fucking magic. Devil magic. But he's not the only religious leader accidentally making our point for us this week. While well, he didn't have the courtesy to die in time for this recording, as of now, anti-vax Cardinal Raymond L. Burke has been hospitalized with COVID after a year plus campaign to convince people not to take the pandemic so goddamn seriously. Now, like I said, Burke isn't dead, but he is on a ventilator, which is no nice. No whammies, no whammies, no whammies, no whammies. No whammies, whammies. Whammies. Now look, whatever you got to shove down his throat to keep him from repeating life-threatening <laughs> conspiracies, I'm I'm okay with that. A whammy would be him living, I guess, in, in Eli's okay. head. Okay, all right, yeah, no, that's fine, that's fine. But according to his Twitter account, thousands of people are praying for him. So it seems like either God doesn't exist or we're wasting a fucking ventilator. God's on it. Right. It feels like an unprayed for atheist should get that shit or at least somebody who wasn't on covid side until the day he was admitted to the goddamn hospital. <laughs> and Greg Abbott just got covid. Isn't that hey, lovely? Oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> it's a great day for the irony variant. It is killing it. <laughs> and in Islamabad news bears news. <laughs> I know the right wing of our government has, at least partially, moved on from blaming Muslims to blaming trans people, masks and I don't know, college education for everything wrong with the world. But yep. for the record, Islam, the religion, still sucks a tremendous amount of ass. Tremendous, yeah. In a bad way. <laughs> yeah. From its holy book to the countries where it's in power, bad shittery just as dangerous as the Old and New Testament is sure to follow. And we got a nice little throwback reminder of that this week when an eight-year-old boy in Pakistan became the youngest person in the history of the country to be charged with blasphemy. In the history of the country. Yeah. That's interesting. It makes it sound like some other country holds the record that's less than eight. Yeah, and Pakistan right. makes fun of those like backwards yokels who jail a seven year old. Like idiots. <laughs> or, or are jealous of them, right? Yeah. Like, I, I, I look, I know that the message they're trying to send isn't our God is such a fragile little pansy, he can't handle an insult war with a third grader, but I'll be damned if I know what it is they're trying to send. <laughs> yes, exactly. Send something. Yeah, so according to reports, the boy, who is Hindu, is charged with intentionally urinating on a rug in the library of an Islamic religious school, which may be true, I don't know. But whether he pissed on the carpet on purpose or not, I think we can all agree he didn't do it with the intention of insulting the Prophet Muhammad. Yeah, yeah probably not. I know he's only eight, but it did really tie the room together. <laughs> so. Oh, for sure, yeah. Yeah, right. So as a result, <laughs> the eight-year-old child was held in jail 
for a week, he and his family have fled into protective custody. And perhaps most ironically, an angry mob vandalized a Hindu temple in retribution. Yeah. But were not charged with blasphemy. Side note, the punishment for blasphemy in Pakistan is death. And more than a week after this kid's release, not a single government authority involved in this case has said that murdering a child is off the table. Okay, so the government is like, I'm rubber and you're glue and we murder you now. And yeah, pretty much. I'm a yep. grown up in the government. And in abstinence news tonight. Fantastic. Joshua Harris, <laughs> thank you, is a fantastic exemplar of how far evangelical pastor is from getting it. Like, like Harris has taken several very public steps towards getting it, but we learned this week that he still isn't even close enough to see what it is. And we learned that when the guy who got rich selling purity culture only to publicly denounce it later offered to help people who were harmed by religious sexual prudery for money. Really? <laughs> yes. He apologized for selling everybody poison for all of those years and offered to make yeah. it up to them by selling them the antidote. Selling the antidote, yeah. And that would be sex, right? Right, yeah. He's, he's selling the concept of sexual intercourse as an antidote. <laughs> he's like, all right, thank you all for coming to the class. And then he just stands in the center of the room and yells, fuck, like he's trying to start a food fight. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So for those of you unfamiliar, that doesn't work, by the way, the yelling fuck thing in the no, middle of it doesn't. doesn't work. No, Harris, I'm not allowed back to that hospital fundraiser yep, yep, we ever know. again. We know you told us a bunch yeah. of times. Mm -hmm. so, so is Andrew. So Harris burst onto the evangelical scene with his 1997 book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, and his 2000 follow up, Boy Meets Girl, Say Hello to Courtship, where he urged readers to forego dating in favor of courtship, a synonym that he imbued with all kinds of new meaning, including bringing your parents along on dates. The book was held up by critics as a prime example of benevolent sexism and promotes rape culture by treating women like property and urging them to be sexually passive. Uh, and the critiques were so convincing, by the way, that ultimately they convinced the author himself, who in 2018 apologized for ever having written it. He also asked the publisher to stop publishing it. And they're like, Dude, we haven't done a production run in 15 years. Sure, yeah, man, we'll not do <laughs> All that. All right, we're going to just shut Stop down this the big, 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 big factory. <laughs> yeah. uh, a year later, he announced that he was divorcing his wife and his holy father, stating in a 2019 interview that he no longer considered himself a Christian. And though he didn't go quite as far as using the A word, he did say that he didn't believe in God anymore. Yeah, that's the drag about becoming an atheist. When you switch over to our side, you have to start confronting the shitty things you did. It's it's way worse than Christianity. Yeah, they, right. Exactly. Where they do the opposite. So he seemed to be heading in the right direction for a minute there. But last week, he learned that he was launching a two hundred and seventy five dollar five week course called Reframe Your Story for people who are, in his words, unpacking and rethinking the religious rules. In other words, for people who were harmed by the bullshit that he got rich selling. And, and to get out in front of the charging for the factory recall feel of the whole thing, he said that there would be a full scholarship for anyone harmed by his previous books because I, I, I guess he thought that acknowledging that he knew how fucked up this was somehow made it less fucked up. All right. So the former KKK Grand Wizard is offering a scholarship to Howard University. That's it, right. <laughs> confusing. Yeah. No, I guess I'll take it. <laughs> to Harris's credit, once he saw the online backlash to the pitch, he ultimately decided not to offer the course. And forgive my cynicism, but in the statement where he announced he was canceling it, he also admitted that virtually everybody who responded wanted the free, like, this is your fault version, and only four people had signed up for the paid version. So, yeah, it does have a bit of a discontinue publishing 15 years after the last production run feel to it. But <laughs> like, one way or the other, he did forego 1100 whole dollars for this because he felt guilty about ruining people's lives for two generations. And I'm pretty sure that puts him near the top of most moral thing an evangelical pastor ever went on to do. So at least he's got that going for him. Go. Yeah. Go, Josh Harris. And in bad luck, Charlie News. As a rule here on The Scathing Atheist, we try not to make fun of the crazy bullshit random religious assholes say, unless it's youth pastor and our employee of the month, Matt Powell. But oh, yeah. generally, we try to avoid rando screaming at a school board meetings. But sometimes the rando is just too wacky and the screaming is just too batshit to exist, which is why we're going to talk about X 
Disney Channel actress Lee Allen Baker's comments at a Tennessee school board meeting Me this week. All right, so I, I feel like I need to clarify that the word random doing a lot of work there in Eli's prohibition. Like, like all we do ultimately is make fun of the crazy bullshit that religious assholes say. We just generally insist that they have an audience like at least as big as ours leading up to it. Or our Matt Powell. Or, Matt or Powell. our Matt Powell. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, right. yeah, thank you. Now, if Miss Baker's name sounds familiar to you, that's because she played the mom on the Disney Channel original TV show, Good Luck Charlie. Oh, she's the mom in Good Luck Charlie. Yeah, she's, she's the, the mom in Good Luck Charlie. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I yeah. guess Teddy should have made one more tape about making sure that mom doesn't hove on down to the local school board meeting because here's what Miss Baker had to say. Quote, I wanted to tell you that I have two vaccine injured children. And they have medical exemptions because after the seizures and the hospitalizations, after all of their immunizations, I was granted, obviously, a medical exemption. So my children are those rare children that will not be able to get the vaccine. End quote. Hey, quick side note. No, I don't believe her. <laughs> Absolutely not. It is 2021. Lying. I'm going to go ahead and assume statistically that everyone who says they or someone they know are vaccine injured are lying. And the 0.0001% of the time that I'm wrong, I'll feel a little bit bad about it. But this, that's my new policy. That's my okay, new policy. Sure. Clearly a lie. But even if she's telling the truth, that means both her kids had a vaccination it led to seizures and a trip to the hospital for both of them. And then she had them get a few more vaccines just to be sure about that right, pattern. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they got more seizures and more hospitalizations. And now she's drawing the line at COVID. Yeah. Look, I, I know this math is imperfect here, but look, pre-COVID, the U.S. was administering over a quarter of a billion vaccine doses a year. And the total number of petitions for compensation for vaccine injury were about 1200 a year way up from five six years earlier like the overwhelming majority of those are dismissed even if they were all legit they would be about one. check my math here heath they would be about one half of one thousandth of one percent yeah and she had two kids in that category <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm okay dismissing this as right. Or Even Noah bones. said squared is the chances yeah, exactly. that she's not lying. <laughs> fraction, the tiny fraction squared. Yeah, fuck yeah. you. Anyway, continuing, quote, and still, I would never put them in a mask because their brain needs oxygen to grow, what? which neurologists can confirm. Wait, what? Well, uh, citation needed, really. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to know what neurologist said oxygen is important. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> she continued, anyway, the real part of the clown show is that you all think you actually have the authority to mandate this because um, there are these books that I have and I have them as a gift for you. The Constitution and the what? Declaration of Independence, <laughs> the <laughs> Bill of happened? Rights. Totally, totally and different get thing. get ready for it, Heath. <laughs> the Federalist Papers. <laughs> wait, wait, there's more. And also the Bible. <laughs> yeah, no, no, those are some great novels of fiction to read. Just like 1984. <laughs> <laughs> cool fictional novels of fiction. Read them. Wow. Papers is in the name of one of the... It's not... <laughs> mm. She concludes, and these guarantee my freedom and yours and our children's to breathe oxygen, end quote. It does. That is that is in the Bill of Rights. So, so wait a minute. <laughs> What does she think those of us wearing masks are breathing then? <laughs> <laughs> Nitrogen. So, She's a chemist. She knows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mostly. Nice. Yeah. Lot to unpack there. That said, it was nice of Miss Baker to give out free books. So I'd like to return the favor with a digital copy of the opening arguments podcast, all the episodes and free air, which I am pleased to inform her is what you breathe even through a mask. Yeah, so that's that's for you, lady. Out. That opening arguments podcast is a really good book, by the way. Yeah, I very love good. <laughs> reading that book. Very good book. And because she's dumb enough to think that air requires postage, I think this is a great time for us to pause for a word from our second sponsor, Stamps.com. <laughs> no, dude, you got to look more formal. What does that mean, look more formal? You're solemn. You know, so you're solemn. solemn. Gu guys, 
What's with the camera and the outfits? Are you, you going to make a Hamilton adult movie parody again? Because we talked about this, guys. Disney is not giving us those rights. All right. First of all, you wouldn't even make the call. So we have no yeah. idea if that's true. Secondly, I, no, we're making our own stamps. Going to make some pictures of Heath dressed as George Washington, do a little printing, little glue. Boom. Saved ourselves the hassle of going to the post office. Guys, if you want to skip the hassle of going to the post office, why don't you just use stamps.com? Wait, wait, wait. What's stamps.com stamps.com brings the same u.s postal and ups shipping services right to your computer they make it easy for small businesses to mail and ship without needing to take a trip to the post office print official u.s postage and shipping labels 24 7 without having to leave your desk or buy any fancy equipment all you need is a computer and a standard printer once your mail is ready, just schedule a pickup or drop it off. It's that simple. We actually use Stamps.com to send out all our Patreon rewards. And as long as Eli remembers to send the names to Lucinda, Stamps.com makes it a breeze. Oh, that reminds me. I have to send her those. I didn't. You sure do. Stop wasting time going to the post office and go to Stamps.com instead. There's no risk. And with our promo code scathing, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in scathing. That's stamps.com, promo code scathing. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. All right, Heath. Looks like we dressed you up as George Washington for no reason again. Yeah, this is the third time in a month. I know. Our wooden teeth budget is out of control. Okay. It's ridiculous. You gotta stop throwing them away. Maybe we'll do something with them. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massachusetts. This week's segment starts in Ireland, and that tells you a frightening amount about the subject, doesn't it? As soon as I said the word Ireland, you knew this was going to be a story about the Vatican coming after somebody's uterus. And you weren't wrong. So Ireland, in case you're listening, and we know you are, big fans of the show... As we go through this first story, I want you to reflect on the fact that that is what you're known for. Anyway, so let me give you the details as I understand them. The state is dedicating some 800 million euros to a new national maternity hospital, which will serve low-income mothers and their young children, as well as women with high-risk pregnancies. The problem is that to do so, they're partnering with the Catholic Church. Or rather, they're partnering with a level of Russian nesting dolls within the Catholic Church with just enough plausible deniability to make the sources of this confusing as fuck. But the fear among secular activists is that the deal currently being brokered is going to allow the Catholic Church to have a say in the running of said hospital. Look, there are a lot of reasons you don't want the Catholic Church involved with women and young children, and it's not just the young children half of the equation. The major fear now is that they're going to get in the way of reproductive rights. There are nominal assurances that all services possible under the law will be available at the hospital, but that doesn't mean the church can't put its thumb on the scale and make abortion hard as ever love and hell to obtain. But surprisingly, not all the abortion news is bad this week. I wanted to highlight an op-ed I saw recently from unofficial statistician of the scathing atheist, Ryan Birch. And the title of the piece kind of says it all. Abortion just isn't the motivating issue for evangelicals it once was. In the article, Birch points to a recent study from the Public Religious Research Institute where they asked a number of Americans where they think the government's priorities should be. And the only thing that ranked lower than abortion among white evangelicals was motherfucking gun control. In fact, fewer than 30% said they thought enacting anti-abortion laws should be a top priority for the government. Of course, this is twin, so even the good news has bad news nested in it. While abortion has been losing importance on the evangelical priority list, it's being replaced with shit like immigration reform. So it's not that they've stopped being bigots, it's that they're parceling out their bigotry in a different way. But still, that's as good as you can really hope for in terms of misogyny-related good news. So we'll wrap things up there, and I'll hand you back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. Next up in headlines, we have a story about Cat Kerr. Oh, always a treat. Yeah, always a treat indeed. <laughs> she works at a prophecy firm as a prophet, for those who aren't familiar. And her job is apparently going to heaven on little half day trips and sure. telling a story about it later. Apparently, people pay her to do this. And much like pastors who speak in tongues are going to run out of noises to make at a certain point, she's running out of 
heaven stuff to talk about. And now she's just making shit up the morning it's due. Really bad homework. And that includes <laughs> last week when she was like, heaven has volcanoes. But uh, okay, but the fun kind, and because you ride lava. <laughs> See, okay. Story. See now, this is why I needed the big addendum on crazy bullshit religious assholes. Say earlier, I wanted to make sure that. Yeah, no, no, makes sense. Makes sense. <laughs> and I gotta admit, I'm getting a little sympathetic to Cat Care. Like she has to describe heaven for a living, and she can't use drugs or sex. Okay, yeah. I'm amazed she's gone as long as she has. Fair. Yeah, she's going longer than Perry Stone with. Made up syllables. That's la, for sure. la, 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 la. <laughs> you went straight to la. It was like your second one, and then the rest was just all la. Wow. So many phonemes, man. Okay. So <laughs> we learned about the heaven volcanoes during Kat Kerr's appearance on a YouTube show called Elijah List with Steve Schultz. And uh, here's what we learned from K Dubs Quote There's rain in heaven, there's absolutely nothing destructive, there's what? no earthquakes. Now, there are volcanoes, but they're for entertainment. Oh. They're for fun. You get to ride the lava out. What? And right after she said, ride the lava out, even Steve Schultz started to check out. <laughs> he, he has, to be clear, a YouTube channel about stupid fucking heaven stories. That's his job. Mm -hmm. And he was like, Come on, cat. Really? Ride out the, do the homework <laughs> earlier. But she continued, it's not a physical volcano that God took from the earth and put it up there. What? So cool. You know, that answers my question. That was that <laughs> you know? It's a spiritual world. She continued, the land, air, everything there is spiritual, but it has substance. It's a literal volcano, but it wouldn't harm you. And yes, what? people can go inside. And they ride the lava out for a ride is apparently what I'm saying. For this <laughs> they story. ride it out End for quote. a ride. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> the, the best part of it is Schultz like visibly pining for the days when she was only medium crazy. <laughs> it's yep. great. His reaction. I like that she thought we were going to call her out on it if she said it was a real volcano from Earth. Right. Like, that's what would make it <laughs> stop adding volcano? up for us, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Are you saying God took a volcano from the Earth and just, like, put it up there? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, she's covering it. Sorry, withdrawn. Spiritual withdrawn Kurt. volcano. Okay. And in blanket statement news, Christian con man, convicted con man, and hey, it's been a while since I threw this one out there. Rapist Jim Baker never seems to run out of ways to get your money. Whether it's silver juice that turns you blue and doesn't cure your COVID, a plant with which you can make your own COVID <laughs> cure because he got in trouble for that last yeah. thing, or most recently a card that calls you a credentialed minister if you buy a bunch of his books. Well, this week he's laying it all out there because for just $1,000, he will give you a miracle blanket that will pay off your bills and your mortgage. What? Really? Just pay your bills right off. It's weird that he would be selling those off. I mean, I'd hold on to those if I had a $5 million bill with the IRS outstanding. <laughs> right? yeah. I, I, there is literally no warehouse mix up or shipping accident that can slow this motherfucker down, right? Like, I, look, I get he's detestable in every possible way, but the way this guy can pivot from seeds to degrees to blankets without ever changing his pitch you got to admit that is kind of impressive <laughs> yep what does yep. that warehouse look like that's insane <laughs> <laughs> it's just the returns department of a home depot <laughs> so here's the quote i'm gonna reiterate that i want you when you order this one thousand dollars to do it in faith to sow that one thousand dollar seed in faith believing that this is part of your seed into the kingdom of god you're doing something for the kingdom of god we're sending out miracles happen blanket sick Sleep under it or do what you want with it. Hang it on the wall. And at this point, his co-host jumps in and adds, again, real quote, lay it over your bills because healing of your finances. Put your wallet in there. Would like physically like have your paper bills printed out and then put them on your blanket. Yeah. yeah, listen to this. Put your wallet in there, your credit cards, all the bills, you know, the mortgage. Put it on there. We're having houses paid off this week. Last month and this month, and I'm like, hallelujah, end quote. 
I, you know, honestly, okay. The fact that none of their suggestions involved eye holes in a hood is better than I expected with them. Yep, that's, that's a win. So, that's yeah. a win. Yeah. Yep. And finally tonight, Matt Staver with one T has not died of COVID yet. Oh, so I think we can all agree that prayer does not work. <laughs> the main reason he's still alive, it's probably the vaccine he got and is pretending he didn't get. Right. Just like almost every single Republican member of Congress. And Staver continued with his vaxxed but anti-vax propaganda last week, announcing that the COVID vaccine is designed by the Illuminati for population control by making everyone sterile. Like, again, with the so-and-so isn't dead opening. Do, stop depressing people. Listen, listeners, we don't know that Matt Staver isn't dead. Thank you. Right? They, like, they wouldn't uh, report on it right it. away, like that minute. We don't know when you're listening to this. I, like, I'm saying there's hope. There's hope. Yeah. Listeners. Yeah. <laughs> I like to pretend he got his penis ripped off by a revolving door and bled to death when I'm sad. That's mine. <laughs> and you don't know that you're oh, not right. That's my go-to. You don't. Un- Everybody take a second and just picture that a few times <laughs> really? and then rewind it. Picture it's it. funny There's a the luggage rewind. cart When involved. the penis gets like yeah, put just... back on in the rewind, it's really funny looking. <laughs> it's, it's ripped, but then it's, it's like it's magical. It just jumps up there. <laughs> All right. So according to Staver, the whole vaccine thing is a secret plot for depopulation and part of a, quote, bigger global agenda. This all happened during a live stream hosted by World Prayer Network. So the first question was probably something like, so you're saying it's the Jews? Yeah, that yeah. tracks. <laughs> but a producer, I guess, caught that at the last second and went to a different question. Somebody asked, and almost quote here, but um, isn't that stupid? Because Trump took the vaccine, Bill Gates took the vaccine, the fuck are you talking about? And Staver responded, this is an exact quote, I don't know whether Bill Gates got it. I don't recall seeing anybody injecting his arm, and if he did, who knows what they were putting in it. Bill Gates is definitely a social Darwinianist. What? Like Adolf Hitler, like Margaret Sanger, like Rockefeller, like the Carnegie Institute, like Henry Ford. So an interesting list they were all darwinianists social darwinianists it's just you could, darwinist is the same word just use the shorter one if they're both words anyway he, he finished by saying they believed in evolution end quote all right like, i'm not saying we knew that matt staver's issue with hitler was that hitler believed in evolution before he admitted to that but I am saying we'd probably have guessed right if you'd asked us, if anybody had bothered to ask. <laughs> okay, here's my question. Why the Carnegie Institute and not the right? guy? I didn't. Does, does he think Illuminati <laughs> genocide was more of a board decision when it comes to Carnegie? <laughs> <laughs> if I'm overruled, I'm overruled. All right. <laughs> you know, it's actually called the Carnegie Institute. Shut up. Nobody <laughs> likes you. And from there, Staver started asking himself questions and he got super confused. He said, if vaccines actually make you live longer, why would you then say people need vaccines? <laughs> and then there's a long pause for him to start making shit up what? to his own sure. question. Yep. He's like, well, it's because they affect reproduction. The vaccines go to certain concentrated places. <laughs> it, it has very high concentration in the ovaries. And then he panicked again. There's a long pause to decide if you should... Uh, keep going. Do a seminar about menstruation and sexually transmitted vaccine herpes here. And he's like, yep, I am going to do that. <laughs> Continuing. What we're seeing with women is missed menstrual cycles, two menstrual cycles a month, heavy bleeding, painful menstrual cycles. We're even seeing that with people who haven't had the shot, but have been in close proximity to those who have. Start asking women in your reches Wow. Yikes. <laughs> with the phrasing. <laughs> In y'all's place of business. What the fuck? That's, that's absolutely super villain speak, right? That's the only category of people that have reached. You, I almost can't say it without mwahaha. At the yeah. end. <laughs> he literally says this. Start asking women in your reaches, mwahaha. <laughs> It may be a sensitive situation, but just ask him. Don't ask After him. After being in close contact <laughs> Do ask him. with somebody who's had the shot, have you experienced any rashes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> don't ask what? him. Yes. Do yeah, it, don't ask him that, but he continues. <laughs> just ask him two questions, actually. Please do. Two questions. Rashes or bleeding? 
And I can guarantee that you'll be surprised at how many women will come back and say, oh my, that's why my cycle is all messed up. End exact quote. I would be surprised if that was the response to any of the, from any of the women in my reaches. So, okay. The <laughs> fact that it doesn't only happen to people who got the vaccine is evidence that you're right. <laughs> like, it's because, like, look, because person who's been around person who's been vaccinated, that's everyone in America <laughs> at this point. Okay. So now. We know all we need to do is trick Matt Staver into a woman's MMA gym and just let nature and his own <laughs> natural curiosity take its course. Yeah, that would be great. Win, 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 win. Absolutely. Also, one other thing. If we have anyone with ovaries in our reaches <laughs> by any chance, y'all got any rashes? Send us a pic. Yeah. <laughs> Don't. Say any of those people in our reaches, <laughs> Matt Staver is looking for evidence. You should send him <laughs> whatever you're thinking that might help with that evidence gathering. Not as an illegal prank, because that would be illegal. Serious right. evidence only that's right. legal. Whoo! All right. So while the folks at stamps.com pat themselves on the back for buying ad slot two instead of ad slot three this week, we're going to close the <laughs> headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Yahtzee. And when we come back, Tom and Cecil will be here to help us form Insult Voltron one last asterisk time. You know, we've been picking away at the 2019 Vulgarity for Charity roast for so long, I'm almost going to miss them when they're gone. Except, no, I fucking won't. Because, holy uh, shit, we are damn near two-thirds of the way through 2021. But we're legitimately almost done. This should be actually the final installment of Vulgarity for Charity. On mm. Scathing Atheist. Yeah. <laughs> Part Till November one, part <laughs> one. Well, yeah, right, right, exactly. Yeah, oh, above 2019's forget. And okay, God. and to help us, of course, knock this out, we're joined by Tom and Cecil from Cognitive Dissonance. Tom and Cecil, welcome back. Oh man, if I want to be done now. If this was a two-year-old car lease, we would be over miles. That's all <laughs> right. <I'm saying. laughs> over miles. <laughs> Keith, you're going to start us out. The category is roasts we still have left. Sure. Um, sure. Kind of hard to set. They don't really at this point. Okay, so Daniel wants you to roast his twin sons, Ryan and Mark. Oh, okay. Hey, Ryan and Mark, uh, quick thing. Feels awkward to be the one to tell you, but uh, you are not twins. Your parents are lying. You're absolutely not <laughs> twins. Not even close. You look like a weird sitcom about a Nazi kid and a Jewish kid and the wacky shenanigans of being roommates. <laughs> you are not related. <laughs> I'd watch it. I'd watch that. Right? The Heil Life <laughs> Zach and Cody. <laughs> 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 All right, and Cecil, you're up Zyklon, next. Beavis, and Butthead. I'm there done. you go. Oh, there it is. Nice. They actually so look like Beavis and Butthead. So good. Well, there you go. Perfecting Schindler's List. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Cecil, you're up next. Don wants you to insult some random guy from Facebook. Okay, so this is a random picture of a deer hunter on Facebook Whoa. that just wrote some really dumb trash. And so, yes deer hunting random guy from Facebook. You are very manly. Nothing says primitive hunter like sitting in a tiny box all day, hoping something will wander by so you can point at it and it dies. That is <laughs> also, your face paint really machos you up there. You look like Robert Smith in camo after a good cry. <laughs> and Noah, this one's for you. Sarah wants a roast for motivational speaker Rachel Hollis. Hollis. I don't know. Hollis, yeah. Oh, I fell into such a deep rabbit hole. So, okay, here's the thing. Sarah requested this back in 2019, and ever since, <laughs> karma has been beating me to this roast. Okay. <laughs> Turns out your how to have a perfect marriage story sell way worse post-divorce, and your struggling mom every woman image sells way worse after you talk about your housekeeper on a live stream and refer to her as the lady who cleans our toilets. But, oh, oh, shit. Oh. Yeah. oh, but don't okay. worry. I'm sure she'll plagiarize something contrite and then blame her social media team for not attributing it. She'll be fine. <laughs> I'm sure she'll be fine. Oh, God, she's such a fucking disaster. Okay, Tom. Yeah. Jesse wants you to roast his friend, Troy. All right. Well, I, I got to tell you, Jesse, I mean, I kind of agree with you. Troy sounds great. I, in your list of wonderful attributes, though, you note that he married a 
multiracial woman, which I can only assume you pointed out because that's somehow like altruistic. In your <laughs> mind, it's a weird detail to add. Like, okay. Would you? Would you not marry? A multiracial woman, Jesse? <laughs> What's that like now? Is that like some kind of sacrifice, Jesse? What are you saying here, Jesse? You sound racist. Not like your friend Troy, though. You know what, Jesse? I'm not going to roast Troy because now he is my best friend and he thinks you're racist. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a no. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Go yeah. Fuck He waited two and a half years for that. I know. That's amazing. So outstanding. Eli. Sitting there next to his white girlfriend. It's finally on. <laughs> <laughs> but Eli, Edgar wants some shade for his former therapist, Dr. James Elliott. Oh, okay. So I could probably just leave my roast at letting you guys know that this is a doctor from Liberty University. Oh, so, you know, wow. that's pretty yeah, much yeah, it. Done. Yeah. So for all we know, defending his thesis consisted of coming on Jerry Falwell's wife's tits the hardest. Oh, <laughs> this is a guy who not once. Wait, the hardest or the most? Because the right. hardest. It's definitely okay. the hardest, nope, not the I'm most. Out. Measured I'm in out. Newtons, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's an oral defense. How many jewels from the family jewels? Yeah. <laughs> so this is a guy who not once, but several times tried to convince Edgar that everything wrong in his life could be fixed if he wasn't an atheist. And uh. when Edgar finally did some digging, he found out that he was a pastor with a fondness for sermonizing about how all languages come from the Tower of Babel oh, incident. Oh, I love that Jesus. so much. Oh, that's so, certainly true. Dr. James, you look like the body camera stand-in for the cast of Pawn Stars, which <laughs> is fitting because when Edgar came to you for help, the best you could do was prophetize. But, <laughs> God. <laughs> Okay, round two, we're on to politics. Heath, back to people who are actually here. This one is definitely for you. Garrett wants a roast of Ohio state legislators, specifically those who created the Student Religious Liberties Act of 2019. Okay, yeah. So first of all, if you're a state legislator from Ohio, you are hoping to be Jim Jordan one day. That's <laughs> right. like your aspiration. It's not a good start. Ugh. And the Student Religious Liberties Act of 2019, it's theocratic garbage. But the people who wrote it are super, super dumb. So it has a built-in backfire clause in it. It says that schools can have a moment of silence, but then it says you can't make anyone participate. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> according to their law, they have to let you make noise during the moment of silence they tried to enact in their law. Wow. Idiots. How very Ohio of them. Yeah. <laughs> Cecil, you're up next. Jeremy wants you to roast California politicians Mike Nager and or Matt Rom. I just went with Matt Rom. Mike Nager is too hard to find. So Matt Rom looks like the like the co-star of a Twins remake with John Travolta, where he's all the leftover bad DNA. <laughs> Let that wow. sink in. He's the leftover bad <laughs> DNA from a super weird Scientologist. He's the fucking toaster shakens from the star of Battlefield Earth. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Noah, this one's for you. I love toaster shakens. Cornell wants you to shit on Canadian politician Faith Julia Goldie. Oh, my God. So she's a Canadian racist. Think about how exhausting oh, that must be. <laughs> right? Like, your, your, your fucking entire country is almost 90% white. How do you even find people to hate? But I'm in a bit of a loss here because when she ran for the mayor of Toronto, her highest visibility endorsement came from Iowa's own Steve King. Oh, my oh God. God. And I just, I can't even dream up shit more insulting than that. Nice. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Tom, this one requires your personal brand of rage. You're going to be roasting an unnamed bigot, but also transphobia in general. The request is from Anna. She's a college age trans woman who was walking down the street when she saw this bigot like grab his child's hand as if to protect the kid from the very concept of being trans. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is the fucking trans bigot version of locking your car doors when a black guy walks past, right? Like, hey, <laughs> asshole, nobody wants your fucking kids. Nobody is going to turn your kids gay or trans or inside out or whatever fucking nonsense you're afraid of. You can't catch being a man or a woman like it's fucking COVID. <laughs> I suspect these people know that. I suspect that when they grab their kids' hands and clutch their pearls, it's just moralistic kabuki theater bullshit meant to reassure themselves that they are the right kind of man because they are not. 
because they are exactly the wrong kind of man, an outdated, terrified, small-minded kind of man. And when you walk past them, they're afraid that everyone can see the extinct dinosaur footprints they're leaving behind them. (laughs) Hell yeah. (laughs) All right, Eli, we're going to close out round two here with a tough one. Transgender and women's rights activist Melina Reyna Svanald Farley Barrett requested a roast of her political opponent for the Florida State Senate, Republican Jennifer Bradley. Sadly, Melina passed away last year after a fight with cancer and Jennifer Bradley won the office. So we need you to roast Bradley and the whole situation in honor of Melina. Jesus fucking Christ. Can I do Noah's cancer like last yeah, time? Right. You know, <laughs> something cheery we can all yuck it up at. OK, so look, Jennifer Bradley matters so little that she's buried on the second page of Google by a vegan hairbrush company. <laughs> Literally, if you Google her. Google has a little sidebar that says, hey, do you mean this bitch? Because you got to tell us because this shit's all hairbrushes. (laughs) Hairbrushes all the way down. (laughs) This woman got nominated for state Senate, Republican, whatever, because her husband is literally the state senator for a district nearby. It's like a nice little fiefdom in Game of Thrones. (laughs) And as evidenced by her Google ability, she is dwarfed by the woman she never even had a shot to run against, right? Melina wasn't an activist in the way that most people mean it, you know, as a replacement for unemployed on their Twitter bio. (laughs) She was an actual (laughs) activist. Don't make fun of podcasting. (laughs) She was... A doer, she was the legislative director of the National Organization for Women in Florida now and the president of Gainesville area now. It is impossible to look her up without being buried under the permanent good she left behind her wherever she went. Not to mention, she was literally fighting for the rights of trans children from her hospice bed. Wow. So... No, she didn't win assistant state senator to my husband's golf buddy. But in every measurable way, she changed the world. And the only thing I can roast about that is not knowing about her sooner. All right, time for a super awkward spiting round. (laughs) Tasteless, tasteless sound effect. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's Morgan's fault. (laughs) The category is friends and family, and I want you to explain why these people got kicked out of Thanksgiving dinner. Heath, you're up first. This one is from Jeremy, and your target is his girlfriend, Leanna. Oh, she got kicked out of Thanksgiving because she's Russian and adopted. Nobody likes that. That's just awful. (laughs) Also, she's apparently a medical death investigator. So, fucking serial killer. She brings her own plastic wrap, though, for leftovers. Yeah. (laughs) All right, Cecil, you're up next. This is from Samantha. Why did Samantha's parents, Aaron and Scott, get kicked out of Thanksgiving dinner? Well, I mean, who even invites vicious liars and narcissists? I mean, I I guess if they accidentally showed up, it would be because they gaslit the turkey so hard it shot out of the oven like a cannon. (laughs) (laughs) Noah, back to you. Why did Vanessa have to kick her stepdad, Kevin, out of Thanksgiving. Oh, I also got a terrible fucking person. So I feel like, you know, he wasn't so much kicked out as he escaped from the oven and ran away with a trail of breadcrumbs <laughs> falling out of his ass. <laughs> so, like, like, honestly, Cannibal Thanksgiving is the only one he deserves an invite to. <laughs> Tom, this was for you from Sebastian. Why did Sebastian have to kick out his friend, Seth? Yeah, Seth got kicked out of Thanksgiving for insisting we shouldn't eat dinner if everyone everywhere also didn't eat dinner. Because Seth is the kind of asshole who doesn't understand that something can be worthwhile, even if it is not perfect. A concept from the looks of him that you would think he would fucking embrace as a life (laughs) motto. There you go. Okay, Eli, why did Mark have to kick out his brother Thomas? Oh, God, why wouldn't he kick him out? Mark describes him as the live action Uncle Ruckus, and he is not wrong. (laughs) Here's my favorite story that Mark shared with us. This dude started smoking because he saw Fox News complaining about non-smoking sections in restaurants. <laughs> what? That's how committed he is to being an asshole. But, you know, given that it's 2021, I'm guessing Mark kicked him out because his ventilator was getting in the mashed potatoes. Yeah, right. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Okay, apparently the bell knows that everybody hates their friends and family, so the spiting round <laughs> continues. We're going to switch it up a little, though. I want you to tell me the name of the song you're going to play as they exit when they get kicked out of Thanksgiving dinner. Yes, we're going two spitings deep. Heath, you're up first. This is from Jackson, who fucking hates his Uncle Steve. I'm with you, man. I hate my Uncle Steve, too. <laughs> okay, so according to Jason, Uncle Steve is a, quote, right-wing nut job. Yep. So we all have mm-hmm. a picture. And... Uh, more specifically, if you don't have a physical picture, he looks like a 
Nintendo me of a capital rider. Like, exactly <laughs> that. Yes, yes. So when he gets kicked out of Thanksgiving for, I'm assuming, ethnic slurs, he's definitely yelling, I'm sorry, I thought this is America. Is this not America? This is America. Freedom of speech. <laughs> so he gets to hear, of course, This is America by Childish Gambit. Oh, nice. Excellent. <laughs> well yeah. done. I think we all want Donald Glover to shoot him with an assault. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh, it, sure, but when I say it. And Cecil, <laughs> this one's from Jason. What's the exit music when he kicks out his BFF slash roommate slash ex-boyfriend, Jay? Okay, this self-described bad boy is wearing Mickey Mouse ears unironically. So I, How? I guess I could just see him getting escorted out and like flexing to Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go <laughs> Been there. Been there. Would you not flex to that? <laughs> I flex to that. Yeah. Thank no. you, Tom. Noah, <laughs> back to you. All right. What's the exit music for Theodore's mom, Mary? Uh, the first two thirds of Crazy Stupid Love. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, this one's I for love you. That movie, though. Yeah. Uh, what exit music will Samantha play when she kicks out her mother in law, Jody? Okay, uh, Samantha will play Don't Stop Believing because everyone loves that song. It's just a great jam. You just got to put it on. Awesome song. Uh, yep. Then hopefully she'll tell her Terrible. shitty mother in law. That while Samantha may be going to hell for being an atheist, Jody is in hell right now, and it's her fucking fault. Jody's world is a shrunken, myopic nightmare, a prison cell of intolerance and stupidity she'll never escape from because she's too fucking stupid and mean to even know she's in it. Then Jody should totally hit some sweet air guitar and slam the fucking door. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> on on the build up. <laughs> Theodore's, yeah. Theodore's bum, Mary is like that too. That's what I meant. <laughs> And Eli, you're going to close out the spiting round. What is Eileen going to play when she kicks out her boyfriend, Felix, from Thanksgiving? Okay, well, based on the photo of Felix, Felix Peter, by the way, that's very important. First of all, I'm just impressed a nine-year-old managed to get the money together for charity, Russ. That's very cool of her. But seriously, this dude looks like the ice cream truck insists that he plays loud music when he approaches. <laughs> so... I guess when she kicks him out of Thanksgiving dinner for bringing some weird German dish like blood pudding, I'm going to guess she's going to do it to Don't Stand So Close to Me by the Police. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, I didn't exactly lie when I said that this was the last segment, but I definitely deceived because while this was the last record for Vulgarity for Charity 2019 on The Scathing Atheist, it's not going to all fit into this week's show, so we're going to be back next week with the actual For Realsies final edition. And on that note, we're going to bid Tom and Cecil a fond and all too temporary farewell. Tom, Cecil, thanks as always. Before we return to our coffins tonight, I want to thank you for your patience while we got through the Vulgarity for Charity roasts, whether you've been waiting on your roast or just Getting a little burned out on that bit. We appreciate it. We're still going to be doing the fundraiser in the future, but we're going to put safeguards on it next time so it doesn't take two years of C-segments to work through all of the uh, insults. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday and an even newer episode of our half-sister show Citation Need debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd be a worse host than the Catholic Cracker if I neglected to thank Keith Enright for always doing more than he needs to. I need to thank Eli Bossing for always doing more than Andrew wants him to. And I also need to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Illusions for always doing more than you think. I want to thank Tom and Cecil one more time for years worth of hard work on this Vulgarity for Charity project. I also want to thank Ty and Tyler from the TNT podcast for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. I have reliable assurances that they are two different people, but you don't have to take my word for it. Check the show notes for a link to their show and find out for yourself. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best people, John Frederick, founding member number nine of the official Stacy Q fan club, lovable terror, crazer, yes, honey buns, crazy, corgi, steel, Farnsworth, dentures, get me hard, CJ, and the official Steve of the podcast. John Frederick and founding member number nine, who have so much sexual magnetism, you can find it with a compass. Lovable terror, crazer, yes, honey buns, and crazy corgi, whose opinions carry so much weight they have to use the freight elevator and steal Farnsworth, dentures, get me hard, CJ, and the official Steve of the podcast, who are so sexy people from the FCC just follow them around with black bars and blur filters. Together, these 11 elegant altruists elected to elevate our allergies for the almighty this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the keen sense of moral obligation and disposable income that it takes to give us money, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash getting atheist, whereby you learn early access to an extended ad free version of every episode or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingadius.com and if you'd like to help but your money's all inflated you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review telling a friend about the show and following at PIATBot on Twitter legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres Tim Robson handles our social media and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark who also rolled the music that was used in this episode which was used with permission if you have questions, comments, or death threats you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingadius.com
No, no worries. No worries. That's why we do the count anyway. So it's like it's like redundancy. We're like NASA. We're a lot like NASA. <laughs> That's us. Pretty much. Nobody cares. Challenger. <laughs> <laughs> We're underfunded. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Don't lose the rocks. We gave you the all. Oh. God damn it. <laughs> oh. They did lose the rocks. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.